My name is Dean Pavlik, and I'm a bioinformatics scientist at Foundation Medicine in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I'm a biomedical engineer by training. I'm not a physician, so please go easy on me this morning. Um, and I've done most of my career doing uh, variant curation and genomic research at FMI. Um, so I, I want to make sure I stay in my allotted time, so please forgive me for relying on these notes so heavily. Um, so first, I want to say thank you to the organizers of this uh, session for inviting me to present here today, and thank you all for your attention this morning. So these are my disclosures. Now, I want to preface this talk by quickly stating that despite all the challenges and nuances I'll be focusing on, uh, it, it's been accepted that in oncology, therapies that target the genomic alterations that drive an individual's disease, at least at a molecular level, can yield dramatic responses. Uh, there are several examples of this shown across many disease types on the screen. And this paradigm certainly offers wonderful opportunity for improved outcomes in cancer patients, but also creates tremendous diagnostic challenges. Uh, for one, there are numerous different classes of genomic alterations, uh, base substitutions, indels, copy number alterations, both amplifications and deletions, and gene rearrangements, uh, namely gene fusions. Now, each of these different types has um, typically been assessed using different diagnostic tests, but clinically each of these data points is um, very important and when seen together really show the full genomic context of a specimen. Furthermore, alterations can mutate proteins via different biochemical mechanisms. I'm sure this is not news to you, um, but EGFR is a fantastic example, so let's just take a quick look at two interacting EGFR kinases. Uh, the L858R substitution, uh, which is associated with sensitivity to frontline EGFR TKIs, uh, switches the polarity of an important amino acid on the activation loop into a constitutively active state. Uh, activating exon 19 deletions on the alpha helix, which are likewise associated with uh, EGFR TKIs, um, th these shorten the axis of rotation between the N and C lobes, again, into a, a uh, constitutively active conformation. T790M, that gatekeeper resistance mutation, changes the size of the relatively small threonine to the larger methionine, which changes the size of the binding pocket of most frontline EGFR TKIs. So obviously, it's not quite as simple as just discovering a mutation and knowing exactly what it does or how it's going to predict a response to therapies. Uh, is it activating, loss of function, uh, kinase impairing, or truly just a benign variant? Uh, another challenge is very simply, there are many genes that are potentially relevant. Uh, in lung cancer alone, which is shown here, there are dozens of genes that are important. And looking across all tumor types, hundreds of genes. Uh, eventually, the cost of whole exome and whole genome sequencing will lessen, but until it becomes cost effective to run these types of assays in a production setting, uh, diagnostics really rely on hotspot testing and, comp and comprehensive gene panels. Um, so how do you decide which hotspot test to run, and how do you decide which genes even belong on your panel? So there, there are many technical challenges associated with obtaining this type of comprehensive molecular characterization. Uh, especially in the clinic and primarily having to do with the samples that are actually available. Uh, unlike in the research setting where we can pick and choose big, bulky, whole resection specimens to study, the clinic can't really afford that luxury. Uh, we have to use whatever material is actually available, and there's a number of challenges associated with this, the most important of which is probably the fact that the tumor content of these specimens can be quite low. Uh, this lends itself to the idea that an assay needs uh, very high sensitivity and accuracy to detect low frequency variants. Typically, over half of the alterations in a routine clinical specimen are present at less than 20% allele fraction, which is pushing the limits of detection of traditionally cap traditional capillary sequencing. So this is a huge advantage of using an NGS-based platform. Uh, another key difficulty is, again, just related to the specimen. Many clinical samples derived from biopsies or fine needle aspirates are physically quite small. Um, clinical samples are routinely FFPE, that formal and fixed paraffin embedded material, uh, which contains formaldehyde. And you can imagine formaldehyde is fairly damaging to nucleic acids, so any sort of molecular diagnostics that rely on DNA from FFPE material needs to be optimized to work in this setting. So here's Foundation Medicine's NGS-based workflow, which I'll go through briefly just to illustrate some common principles. Uh, we start by extracting DNA from generally available biopsy or surgical specimens. We need as little as 50 nanograms of input DNA, which undergoes sequencing library construction and solution-based hybridization capture. Uh, these hybrid-selected libraries are sequenced to a high depth using the Illumina HiSeq platforms. 
Uh, the protocols and reagents for this process have been highly customized uh, and optimized to work for our workflows. Now, following DNA sequencing, we apply a customized analysis pipeline that's capable of detecting all of those classes of uh, genomic alterations with very high sensitivity and specificity. Uh, the genomic variants that are detected then go through extensive annotation based on both publicly available and in-house databases of somatic versus germline and functional annotation versus um, the, the medical literature. So finally, a clinical report is issued to the ordering oncologist in typically less than two weeks, and we're trying very hard to drive that turnaround time even lower. Um, now, I, I just want to stop for a moment to say that the, the first three pieces here are relatively fixed, and the scientific community as a whole is getting better at them. Uh, the big challenge is the last piece, the medical reporting aspect. And that, that's really because identifying all the alterations uh, in a specimen is not hugely valuable unless you can communicate to the care teams how to actually interpret and use this information. So here's an example of, a of the first page of a Foundation One report. Uh, at the top, uh, patient information is outlined. The alterations that we believe to be functionally relevant are summarized in the middle. Um, while the variants of unknown significance, those VUSs, are outlined in the back page. Now, connections between detected variants and potential therapeutic options, including on and off label FDA approved therapies, as well as active clinical trials that may be relevant, are summarized towards the bottom. Now, it's important to note and often overlooked that the scientific rationale for these connections is extensively outlined on the subsequent pages. So if you have an FMI report, please continue to read past the first page. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I, I just want to try and highlight some key elements of doing successful NGS-based profiling. This is not meant to be fully comprehensive, but uh, it does cover many aspects that I consider critical for the process. So first, every specimen should be reviewed by a board-certified pathologist. This is not only to confirm the pathological diagnosis, but also to ensure that there's sufficient material and sufficient tumor content to even expect a successful test result. We don't want to run the test and burn the biopsy specimen if we're not even expecting the test to work well. Uh, we should also look for optimization of the DNA extraction protocols to work on FFP specimens from diverse tissue types and especially for small samples. In terms of the lab process, what's critically important is achieving high and uniform sequence coverage across all the targeted regions of the assay. Uh, there are two main parts to this goal. High coverage is a fairly simple point. Any genomic region which is not sequenced to high depth is going to be a blind spot for the test. Uniform coverage is equally important and its message is often neglected. Large variations in coverage, even in an overall high coverage specimen, can lead to faulty normalization or uh, correction later in the analysis, particularly with respect to GC correction and copy number profiling. Additionally, we need to be able to remove all uh, sequencing reads that are a result of PCR duplication. Um, PCR duplication of the initial input DNA. Uh, so achieving, say, a thousand X sequence coverage is impressive, but it, it's not really useful if all of those sequencing reads are derived from just a few input DNA molecules. So the hybridization capture and molecular barcoding techniques that, uh, that we employ should really help uh, achieve this high uniform coverage and also help filter all of those PCR duplicate reads. So employing state-of-the-art variant detection methods is also vitally important. Uh, we need to be able to detect all of those classes of genomic alterations, not just select ones, uh, and even if they occur in only a small fraction of the DNA molecules. A comprehensive profiling is very different from a hotspot test um, and other methodologies in that a hotspot test will ask the, the binary question, is the BRAF V600D mutation present? Or a comprehensive approach asks, what does BRAF look like? Um, this is a little bit more open-ended and enables us to find V600E, just like the hotspot test, but also allows us to find V600D or V600K or an insertion at this locus, all of which would fall outside of the technical specifications of most hotspot tests, but actually have fairly similar therapeutic implications. So in order to do this, you need to have an intelligent baiting strategy for your assay. High-quality indel calling is extraordinarily difficult to do and really requires non-standardized uh, analysis methods, which are computationally fairly intensive, but do yield superior results. Uh, the standard GATK, that Genome, Alight, or Genome Analysis Toolkit, um, was fantastic back in 2013, but we've come a long way since then. Uh, to my knowledge, De Bruin Graph local reassembly methodologies are among the best ways to call indels right now. 
Also, for copy number alteration detection, we need to be able to detect and differentiate polysomy, uh, which is changes in copy numbers of whole chromosome arms. Uh, this is typically less clinically actionable than focal copy number alterations, which involve segments that are generally less than 10 megabases in size. Hyperploidy and the harmonics of diploidy and tetraploidy are also other issues associated with copy number profiling that really should be addressed. Now, these computational methods have proven their utility, but even the best are not quite flawless. Um, so quality control is a critical aspect of good diagnostic testing. So we should expect a number of algorithmic methods to ensure the quality of our test results. Now, I, I would be amiss to neglect that there's a team of genomic analysts at Foundation Medicine who manually curate every variant in every sample. Um, so it's their sole job to focus on genomic QC and follow up, um, correct and improve all the bioinformatics processes. So that used to be my responsibility. So I've personally curated every variant in somewhere between 35 and 40,000 samples. Um, so I'm relatively familiar with the intricacies of genomic QC and the value that it can actually bring to the patients. Um, this ensures consistency of test results, helps improve the quality of the report, and creates a positive feedback loop with the analysis pipeline to help improve the algorithms. So this is just to show you some of the raw data that the curators see um, and give you a sense for what it's actually like to curate a sample. Um, this is what a BRAF V600E mutation looks like, uh, at least from the raw sequence data. Uh, so this is a screenshot from IGV, uh, a software that's commonly used to view NGS data. Um, each of the gray segments is a 49 base pair read that fits onto the reference genome, HD19, that, that sequence that normal human DNA is supposed to be. Um, these reads stack up, and you can imagine that they extend well below the screen. Uh, so I've zoomed into the 15th exon of the BRAF gene. So all of the bases on the gray reads that are not mutated and actually match the reference are hidden, while um, all, all of the actual mutated bases are highlighted. And you can see some spotty sequence noise here and there, but for the most part, in the center, you can see an extremely strong signal of a real mutation. This is what we should be looking for when we're making real variant calls, at least for base substitutions. So these reads have been extensively cleaned up to show both ends of chimeric read pairs. Uh, blue on the left flips around or inverts to match with blue on the right, and cyan does the same. Um, so this is a rearrangement that yields an EML4 ALK fusion as a result of a 13 mega base pair inversion on chromosome two. And here's a copy number profile. Uh, this is from a high tumor content specimen to show the different copy number levels present in the tumor's genome. The top plot shows the estimated allele counts for each region of the genome, chromosome one, two, three, all the way down to X and Y. Um, and you can imagine that as, as the tumor content of the um, tumor, as the, con the relative ratio of tumor DNA to contaminating stromal DNA decreases, this plot is gonna compress in on itself and it's gonna make it extremely challenging to make copy number calls in low tumor content settings. So finally, as I mentioned earlier, proper reporting of test results is arguably the most important piece of the puzzle. Uh, so in order to do this, we need to first appreciate that genomics is, at least in a sense, a study of position. Uh, mutations can be referred to by their chromosome, their gene, the amino acid, base pair, uh, but these values change with different references or different filters on the back end. Uh, for example, when BRAF V600E was first discovered, uh, the Nature publication describing it called it BRAF V599E. Uh, so after a little bit of confusion, we now realize that they just used a different reference um, and ignored the initiating methionine. So first and foremost, it's important that the scientific community is able to precisely describe mutations via solid references to the genome and to the position. Then there are many other types of annotation that are required for a clinical assay. Functional versus passenger, somatic versus germline, clinically actionable versus not, um, clonality, zygosity, cis, trans, uh, the, the list goes on. Um, we need to be able to correctly report non-canonical actionable variants, appropriately report pathogenic germline variants, and correlate these genomic alterations to the appropriate therapies, clinical trials, and resistance to therapies. This last bit is an ongoing endeavor to um, incorporate new biological knowledge, approved therapies, and ever-changing clinical trials. It's a point that we discussed in yesterday's sessions, but I wanted to raise again. <clears throat> this is especially difficult with respect to different nations, different governing bodies, and different regulations for off-label and compassionate use cases. 
I'd, I'd like to reiterate that this is not a, a unidimensional question and shouldn't be treated as so. It's a multivariate equation where we need to intelligently think of combinations and permutations of chemotherapies, targeted therapies, and checkpoint inhibitors so that we can rationally and scientifically strategize and design clinical trials. And I'd argue that we're the ones that need to do that designing. Well, you as physicians, not me. Um, so it, it's also, the, and this is the, the last topic that I wanted to discuss today, um, is the principle of analytic validation, uh, which is, I think, fundamentally important. It's not enough to just claim that you have a good test. You need to be able to prove this to the broad scientific community by publishing assay validation in peer-reviewed public journals and providing publicly available raw data to allow for full scrutiny of your validation claims. Analytic validation needs to cover the full diversity of alterations that are reported on the test and shouldn't just be a list of variant calling thresholds. Also, and this is a technical nuance, but for a comprehensive genomic profiling test that's able to assess millions of mutations across millions of base pairs, false positive rates really should be reported as positive predictive values. Uh, reporting, false pos reporting false positives with a base pair specificity metric can really uh, hide and obscure really high false positive rates. Uh, for example, a test with five false positives, five true positives, and a million true negatives has an overall pretty poor performance, but has a statistical specificity of 99.999%. So properly validating a diagnostic test is critical. This is how you prove to yourself and to the community what your performance actually is. Now, here's a summary of uh, the results of Foundation Medicine's validation study, which was done in early 2013, so five years ago. Um, the assay performance for detecting base substitutions and indels is extremely good, even down to very low allele fractions. Um, copy number alterations and gene fusions are harder to detect, and the performance falls off in, in, uh, in low tumor purity specimens, but the sensitivity is still extremely high. And in my opinion, the most important metric is that across all cases, uh, false positives are very well controlled with a PPV of over 99% across the board. So I'll close just by saying that there are many families of assays that each have their own respective challenges and technicalities. There can be uh, combined DNA and RNA sequencing for improved detection of gene fusions, uh, liquid biopsies designed to assess mutations from CT DNA, uh, and finally there are genomic phenotypes to examine, biomarkers like TMB and MSI that help predict responses to immunotherapeutic agents, genomic loss of heterozygosity to discover homologous recombination defects, uh, or mutational signatures like APOBEC or alkylating agents or UV damage. Now, I'd be happy to uh, talk about these more later if anyone has any questions, but for now, thank you very much.